as we as said we earlier, earlier, you know, normally, normally you hear, you hear from, from um, one, one of your, of your pastors, pastors on Sunday mornings, mornings when we come, when to, come to the time for preaching, for preaching but, but um, we're, we're so, so excited, excited to get to invite to Josh, Josh to come and come share with share us. With and so please, so please welcome, welcome him. Yeah. Um, to... yeah, I think it's on. So glad to be here with you guys. Um, <clears throat> And my wife, Ashley, and I, Ashley's down here, um, we get to hang out with you guys later this evening to tell more about Togo, and you get to hear from Ashley, who's way more wiser than I. I'm just the one they give the microphone because I talk more. So, um, <clears throat> so but we're so thankful to be here with you guys. Um, some of you may not know, but you are partnering with us in ministry in Togo. And so we get to be hands and feet to College Creek Church, to the ends of the earth. Um, while you're reaching your Jerusalem, your Judea, your Samaria, we get to be a part of College Creek reaching the ends of the earth and ultimately coming to help the Togolese church exist and to, for them to reach their Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth as well. And so um, we love getting to spend time together with our, uh, our partners in ministry, and we couldn't do what we do without you and your prayers and your support, and God is doing some amazing things in Togo right now that makes no sense to me, and that's what's so awesome about it, and, um, but I also just love getting to open this word together um, because it is transformative. It's transformed my life. It's transformed yours. It's transformed countless lives in Togo, um, and I love it because it's relevant for us, but it's also relevant for everyone in the world. And, and this word connects us together. Um, but I also, I want to take this moment to just, for us to kind of think about the reality of the, the rest of the world and the church around the world. We have the opportunity to open this word, to worship God without fear of somebody walking through this door and imprisoning us or killing us for what we believe. And I know things in America are changing and we, we ask the question, maybe that will happen to us one day, but the reality is it isn't happening to us today in this moment. So I would hate for us to waste this moment together of being able to do this freely when we have brothers and sisters around the world right now who are gathering together with fear not knowing if this will be the last day that they live, but they are saying to live is Christ and to die is gain. And I am joyfully coming together with my brothers and sisters to open this word. I don't want us to forget about them and the church as we get to do this freely together. Ashley and I live in Togo where uh, it's not illegal to be a Christian there today, right now, um, but it is not culturally acceptable. Uh, this is the birthplace of voodoo, voodoo, Aneho Togo, Wida Benin are known as sister cities, and this is the slave coast, and I don't think there's a coincidence that these evils are connected, and we live 10 minutes from a post-abolition slave home in Togo, which was used after the slave trade was abolished, and people were still exporting precious human life to the western hemisphere. And this is the darkness that remains still. It's a spiritual bondage in a lot of ways in Togo now where, where worshiping of idols and voodoo has taken uh, the place of, of, of slavery in a lot of ways. And, and it is a, 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 they are trapped in this spiritual darkness. And it makes me think of a, a friend of mine. His name is Simon or, or Simon. Um, and I have a picture of him. He, is, um, he, he was the son of a witch doctor. He gave his life to Christ about uh, 14 years ago, and, uh, uh, and his whole family generationally was raised to worship voodoo. Uh, he, he was raising his family to do the same thing, but miraculously, God saves him through uh, one of our first church plant there in Togo, and he's raising his entire family of eight kids now um, in the church. He himself is planting a church uh, up the road in his uh, home village, which has no church, uh, is known for being one of the darkest areas in Togo. Just a, a couple of years ago, we had our first youth camp that happened there where our young Togolese youth went and ran the camp completely on their own in this village. And they were being chased out of the village saying, we are worshipers of Satan. 
right? And so don't bring this message in. This is not normal for Togo, right? This is, this is something that the, the youth got together and said, hey, we prayed and asked God to send us to the hardest places, and we found it. So they were celebrating the fact that they got to go to this place, and he is planting this church in this area. And currently, probably right now, even in this moment, he's on the way out here where he's made disciples, and they're meeting under a mango tree, very simply opening the word together. And many, many that are a part of this church that said yes to Jesus are risking everything to get together and to open this word together. Because they are telling their community that they are leaving voodoo to believe in Jesus. And many of them have been told by friends and family that if you leave voodoo, we will sacrifice you to our idols. This is the reality of other believers around the world. And they are joyfully coming together to say to live is Christ and to die is gain. And so they are going to be sacrificing a lot to be able to open this word together. And I would hate for us to miss this opportunity to, not, to, to join our hearts with our brothers and sisters around the world uh, in Togo and, and others in the Middle East, in Asia, everywhere, that we would think of the freedoms that we have, that we'd be encouraged by their testimonies of their boldness, and that we would allow that to be an opportunity to open the word together and to boldly proclaim the word in our communities. So let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your graciousness, your mercy, that we do get to open this word together, that it is transformative for us, that we get to do it freely as brothers and sisters. God, we don't take this for granted. It is a blessing God, I, I, I pray for the church around the world, the persecuted church, those that are gathering today even, that are risking everything for your sake. God, I pray that you would give them courage, that you would give them strength and protection. God, that their testimonies would encourage us in our freedom, that we would not waste this moment, and take advantage of the freedom we have to worship you. God, I pray that you would speak to us. Let it be your words that speak directly to our hearts, that we would join our brothers and sisters around the world, saying to live is Christ and to die is gain. The things that this world has to offer don't come into comparison of you. God, lead and guide us through your word this morning. Amen. Father, uh, I, I'm super excited to be in the book of Mark and the Gospels and pick up where you guys have been uh, in. And so we're going to be in chapter 8, uh, verse 27, working through this very, very important passage in Mark. In a lot of ways, it's a hinge passage to the book where uh, up to this point, a lot of the context is who do you say that Jesus is, right? We're trying to see who this Jesus is. Many people are interacting with Jesus and seeing him do miracles. Disciples are coming along and many people are asking that question, who is Jesus? And now he's going to look to his disciples and ask them, well, who do you say that I am? But we'll, we'll pick up and go uh, verse by verse here in verse 27. Jesus went on with his disciples to the village of Caesarea Philippi. And this place is really important for us to know because Caesarea Philippi is a long way away from where the disciples and Jesus lived in Galilee. And they, they were on this journey with Jesus and he takes them up to this place called Caesarea of Philippi. Now this place was known for worshiping the god Pan. Okay, and this was half man, half goat, and they worshipped him, and it was uh, a, a, a lot of sex worship and different um, crazy, bizarre things that they would do to, to worship and sacrifice to this god of Pan. And, and culturally, uh, this was known as the gates of hell. That is what this place was known as, okay? And that's really important for what we get to later and what Jesus declares to the disciples. But this is the backdrop to what Jesus is ultimately about to talk to his disciples. And so very important for us to understand the context of where Jesus is, okay? And so this is completely opposite 
of who Jesus is and the backdrop of what he's going to ask them. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? So he begins to ask that question, hey, we've been hearing, you've been seeing me do miracles and teachings and things like that. What are the people saying about me? And they go on in verse 28, and they told him, John the Baptist, and others say, Elijah, and others, one of the prophets. So basically, a lot of the talk is, you're doing some really crazy things that we don't really have a box for. So you must be a prophet. You're definitely a really good teacher. Uh, maybe you're one of the prophets of old that has come back and manifested today for us. Who knows? Could possibly be the Messiah that we've been waiting for. We don't know, right? So this is what the, the culture and the people around them are saying Jesus is. And so he's asking them, what do people say, who do people say that I am? And then he changes it to make it very personal for the disciples. And he asks them, but who do you say that I am? And this is the single most important question that everybody is going to have to answer. Every single one of us will stand before God, our creator, and have to answer this question. Everybody in the world, this is the most important question that we could be asked. Who do you say that Jesus is? And that's what he's asking the disciples right here. Who do you say that I am? I know what the world says about me. I know what culture says about me, but who do you say that I am? And then Peter. Peter's the one who's always going to talk most. He's always going to talk first. And he gets him into a lot of trouble. And later on, he, he does some pretty cool things too. But Peter answered him, you are the Christ which is a really important statement. What, G what Peter is saying is you are Lord. Lord of all, the creator. You are the savior, the Messiah that we've been praying for. This is a really important declaration and Peter gets it right. At face value, he gets it right, okay? And so here's the, here's the other thing. If we look back in uh, Matthew um, the parallel passage is in Matthew 16. And, and the reason why I, these passages are, are slightly different is because Matthew is speaking to a different audience when he's writing his. And his big thing is he's trying to show that Jesus is king. He is the king. And then Mark's really biggest focus is Jesus is the suffering servant that the prophets prophesied about. And these two are held in tension. He's the king of all, yet he suffers and dies. How does that make sense? And so that's why in this passage, it, it says it a little bit different. And we see in verse 15, he asked the same, he asked, he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. The song that we sang earlier. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Remember the backdrop. He is standing in the gates of hell. What is culturally known, he is saying, here it is. They are worshiping this God of Pan. They are worshiping other things. They are trying to find life and and, and worldliness and godliness in this. And he is standing to be the complete opposite of this backdrop of Caesarea of Philippi. And so when he's talking about the gates of hell, he's, he's talking about the literal uh, or the spiritual gates of hell, but also the ones directly behind them. So the disciples' mind are turning right here, okay? This is a declaration of war against the enemy, all right? So that is what Peter is thinking about when he says, you are the Christ and the Messiah. And so Peter gets it right in word that Jesus is Lord. And again, this is the most important question that we can answer because, and it's still important for us because many of us here 
that our believers would, would have answered this question and said, Jesus is Lord of my life. But, but sometimes we, we try to fit Jesus in our boxes, right? And, and he's Lord of my life where I want him to be, but maybe he's not Lord over all of my life, okay? And, and Peter, honestly, in this moment, probably has a different mentality when he's saying that Jesus is Christ, the Messiah. He's seeing, hey, we're declaring war against the enemy. Also, in this time, we're enslaved to the Romans, and, uh, and they are over us, ruling and reigning, and we know that the Messiah is going to come back victoriously, and we are going to be a nation again, right? This is what he's thinking. He's thinking very worldly, humanly, logically, on what it means for Christ to be the Messiah. And so, so Peter has these preconceived notions of what saying yes to Jesus is and saying yes, Jesus is Lord. Because I want Jesus to be Lord of my life if he's going to conquer the enemy. But do I want Jesus to be Lord of my life if it means I have to lay down my life? And so this is the most important question, again, that we can answer because what we believe about Jesus will always impact the way that we follow Jesus. And so Peter goes on, and the passage goes on. So after this declaration, Peter got it right. And just a couple of verses later, something drastically changes. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. And honestly, it makes sense, right? Like, Jesus just said, I'm going to conquer the enemy. But then he's going around talking about how he's going to die. How does this make any sense? And so Peter's saying, wait, 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 wait. You're supposed to be the Christ. You're supposed to be the Messiah, fitting him into Peter's box and understanding of what that means to Peter. This, Jesus, this is what you're supposed to be. So what you're saying right now, you shouldn't be saying that. This doesn't make sense. You're supposed to be the conqueror, the victor. And Jesus says, I will be, just in a way that doesn't make sense to you. And so Peter's rebuking him and saying, "This no, Jesus, this can't be right. But if we're honest, we do this a lot in, in different ways. In, in some ways, we think it's noble, right? Like I can think all the time about how I'm praying for God to do something. And God, if you would just answer this prayer, it would be all better in this person's life, in my life or whatnot, wh whatever it is. God, if you healed them, things would be better, right? If you just, what I am doing in these moments is putting myself in the place of God. Like I've got it under control because again, G Peter claimed Christ as Lord, but Lord in Peter's eyes, not Lord of Lords, Lord over all. And if we're honest, we do the same thing. And, and one of the most relevant things in the Bible, I think, is in the next chapter, uh, chapter 9, when uh, the, 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 the father of the demon-possessed child, right? What does he do? The disciples can't cast it out. And then Jesus comes to him and says, uh, you know, if, and, and the, the father says, if you can do this. And Jesus asks the question, what do you mean, if I can do this, right? And he said, I believe, help my un." belief. That is the most relevant, to me at least, is I want to believe everything that you are, Jesus, but I need your help to help me believe that everything you are, right? So, so let's give Peter the benefit of the doubt here. And Peter is very nobly saying, Jesus, if you want to be conqueror and victor over the gates of hell, this is not the way to do it. This doesn't make any sense. And so Jesus says in verse 33, but turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. This is, this feels bipolar a little bit. Like Jesus just got done saying, I'm going to build my church on you, 
what just happened? And now Satan, what is happening? And here is the most important statement to understand this. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Right? So Peter is claiming Christ to be the Christ, to be the Messiah, to be Lord of all, but to be Lord of all in Peter's box. And Jesus is rebuking him and saying, you are thinking like the world, which by the way is thinking like Satan. And I'm calling you to think like me. And to think like Jesus is radically different than how the world thinks. It doesn't make any sense. Because how in the world are you going to conquer sin and death by dying? Right? And Jesus goes on. This is what it means to think like God. In calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, if anyone would come after me. So if you're going to say that I am Lord, then you got to let me be Lord. And so being Lord means I dictate where we're going and how we're getting there. And so anybody that would come after me, let him deny himself and pick up his cross and follow me. And we know about the cross. This was a sign of torture, the worst way to die. It was designed by the Romans to keep the Jews in line. And so if, if you did, they would purposely put it in the streets so that people would walk by and they could mock them, but then also be reminded that could be you if you step out of line, right? So this is a torturous, terrible device. And he's saying, willingly pick this up because that's what Jesus is going to do. He's going to put this on his back and he's going to go to this place and suffer and die. And if you are not willing to do that, then I am not Lord of your life. For whoever would save his life will lose it. This is where when Jesus comes into your life, everything flips upside down. So where the world and we think I'm trying to gain my life. He's saying, where you think you're gaining it, you're losing it. But when you lose it, you gain it all. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? He's thinking spiritually, right? And that's what it means to say Jesus is Lord of all. It's to trade the things of this world and to take on who he is. For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. These are important words. Peter, he got it right. By word, he wanted Jesus to be Lord, but Jesus is Lord, and he is Lord over all. And so to say yes to Jesus, to be a follower of Jesus, is to let him be Lord over all, and to follow him makes no sense in this world, which is owned and operated by Satan. So, though it seems harsh, that Jesus would call Peter, say, in whom he is going to build his church on. That was a promise, a declaration, this will happen. And in the same moment, we can find comfort in, Peter didn't get it all right. He got it a lot wrong a lot of the time, and Jesus still somehow used Peter. I find that very comforting for myself, is that somehow he could use me to build his church, his church church. He is the one who will conquer sin and death. He is the Lord over all. And so the most important question we can ask is who do you say Jesus is? And to never, to, 
to, to be on our knees praying, Jesus, help me think like you. Not like this world, because if we think about it, and we really kind of take assessment of the way we think and operate, we've got a lot of the world still in us. But we've got the power of the Holy Spirit in us as well, which conquers that. And so submission, coming before Christ, being with him, that will change everything in us. And so the most relatable cry of, I believe, but help my unbelief. I want to think like you, God, but I think like the enemy of this world. <clears throat> Father, change me. I want to think like you, right? This is how we reach the community. This is how life transformation happens. It starts personal evangelism, right? Every single day coming before God, being in his word. These are the things that help us to be like Christ, to think like him, to be transformed into him. Our call, our calling this is something that we always try to figure out, right? What is our calling in life? Here, here is what it is. To be holy like God is holy. That's it. That should be our pursuit. And I think a lot of times in missionaries, we are the worst at this, is, is we want to go do a lot of things for Jesus. We want to go spread his word and do a lot of things for him, but we neglect being with him to being transformed in our lives. And this doesn't come in conflict. This isn't lazy. What could be less important than coming into the holy of holies before God? Being with him, desiring him more than desiring anything that this world has to offer. And here's the deal. Like Moses coming into the tent of meeting, he would get to meet face to face with God, but then he would leave. And his face was transformed, red, shining, that they had to cover his face. But everybody knew that Moses was with Jesus. And so the life of Jesus being Lord of all means we're spending a lot of time with Jesus. Asking him to transform the way we think, the way we live. And I promise you, what comes from that will be proclaiming him as well. Meeting the needs of the community in a more holistic way because we ourselves are in just as much need of those around us. We can't forget that. So, who do you say Jesus is? Is he Lord of all, over all of your life? <clears throat> what are the ways that we need to come before Christ, you individually, me personally, and say, Lord, I'm thinking like the world right now. And I want you to transform my thoughts. I want the things of this world to disappear. This is humility. This is picking up our cross. This is submitting to the king of kings and letting him be Lord of all. So I confess you as Lord Jesus, but help me follow you. Because what we believe about Jesus will always impact the way that we follow him. So what do you believe about Jesus? Who do you say that Jesus is? Father, I just want to pray for my brothers and sisters here at College Creek Church. God, I, I thank you for them. I want to... Um, just start in thankfulness of who you are in their lives, what you've called them to do here in this community. And God, I pray that you would daily reveal yourself to them in new and powerful ways. Lord, that this church and everybody in it, including myself, we would think more like you. Lord, that the things of this world would fade, that the things of this world in our life would be counted as nothing. We don't want these things. We want you, even when it means laying down our entire lives. 
Lord, I pray that you would raise up laborers here to be in the harvest, Lord. But Lord, I pray that everybody would desire to be more like you, to be transformed by you, and that transformation would be a proclamation to the world. God, I pray for the courage. I pray for boldness over College Creek. God, I pray for, for blessing, Lord, that you would protect them, that you would bless them. <clears throat> Lord, that, that they would know you more, that you would be Lord over all. God, that many, many people in this community would come to know who you are and claim you as Lord over their lives because of the people here. Lord, I pray that you would give them strength and encouragement and the courage and the boldness to go out and to be transformed and to see others transformed by you and your power. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.